Thank you so much, Keith, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk in this series. Um, like yourself, um, I really like to learn from other areas of application. I think there's a huge amount to learn uh, by by doing that. So yes, I, I, I am an economist, although I'm probably unlike some economists. My primary motivation is to identify how to make good social choices made on others' behalf. That's kind of what motivates me, always has. And that's why I ended up working in the field of health, because that offered, at the time at least, the greatest opportunities to start to explore that and see how we could uh, make that real. And certainly in the UK, decision science and an explicit approach to difficult choices has been at the heart of decisions for two decades, uh, the formation of NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in 1999. I was a founding member of that appraisal committee and sat on that committee for 13 years. And that body, NICE, makes decisions about access to healthcare and they are mandatory decisions. So it's been a way in which to operate as an academic, you kind of do your academic work, but then you're also part of the decision-making process. And that's been incredibly useful uh, 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 and very important. So what about decision science and making decisions uh, in healthcare? Well, the kind of questions that I've kind of devoted much of my career to are, well, which health technologies, mainly drugs, but not always, which health technologies, what price should we pay and how much evidence do we need to support their widespread use? Now, these sound interesting, but they also sound kind of quite technical. But let's be very clear about this. These decisions are some of the most profound decisions you can have in social choice. What we're actually talking about when we make these choices is who will live a little bit longer and who is going to die a little bit sooner. And those are very profound and they ought to be accountable to reason, to evidence and all the evidence and also to widely held uh, social values. They also should be scrutinized to the greatest possible extent. And the decisions that I was involved in on the NICE appraisal committee certainly were. Um, so here's a few, I'm not gonna explain each one. These are a few headlines from newspapers as a consequence of choices that we made on that committee. Um, Charter for Promiscuity is one of my favorites, uh, but there's, there's many more. Um, now, not only did we suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous editorial comment from the red tops, this is what uh, John Harris, the then editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics, had to say about the role of economics in these kind of choices and the role that uh, Tony Collier and myself in particular were playing in having an influence on nice methods of uh, appraisal, that we were responsible for wickedness, folly, more likely both, that we were ethically illiterate, socially divisive and responsible for the perversion of science. So, so John Harris was quite upset and um, obviously uh, I regarded this as fighting talk and it led to an exchange of about eight papers in his journal, which I think was very useful actually to try and bottom out what role uh, decision science and economics ought to play in these difficult choices. Let's examine a bit about whether John Harris had a point and the basic principles of why we need decision science and economics in these choices. Let's imagine for a moment that the primary purpose of healthcare is to improve people's health. It's not the only purpose, but it is a primary purpose. And secondly, let's imagine that everybody counts and that everybody counts equally. Probably not true, but let's imagine that's true for a moment. Then the question becomes, well, how should we make those choices? Well, the first thing we need is a measure of health. If that's what we care about, we need to be able to measure health. And we need to measure that's going to capture the impact we're likely to have on survival and quality of life in a way that reflects people's preferences. Now, we have those measures. They're not perfect by any means, but they do attempt to do that in a way that captures people's preferences when confronted with choices. And that's a quality adjusted life year. So imagine the green dot represents what the NHS has currently got available. The x-axis is the qualities gained. And let's imagine we go out, we identify the evidence, we synthesize it, we estimate long-term effects using decision analytic modeling. And let's imagine that for a particular technology, for every patient treated, we expect to gain two quality adjusted life years. At the price the manufacturer is charging, it's gonna cost the NHS an additional 20,000 pounds. 
taking account of any cost savings or additional costs. It's a net cost to £20,000 per patient treated. One way to kind of express what's on the table here is to say, you know what, this new technology, for every £10,000 we spend on it, we gain one quality adjusted life year. Is £10,000 per quality worthwhile? Well, to answer that question, we need to know where that £20,000 is going to come from and what else we could have done with it. In other words, we need to understand the opportunity cost of this choice. Let's imagine for a moment that we believe the health opportunity costs are £20,000 per quality. What we're saying is that £20,000 elsewhere in the healthcare system could have delivered one quality adjusted life year for other NHS patients. What does that tell us? What's on offer is £10,000 per quality. Our health opportunity cost is 20. What does that actually mean? Well, what it means is that on average, we expect to gain two qualities for every patient treated, but we expect to lose one quality, quality adjusted life year elsewhere in the NHS as a consequence of those costs. In this case, we gain two qualities, we lose one. This is good value to the NHS because we improve health outcomes overall. We have a net health benefit of one quality. What if, the what if the manufacturer decides to charge a little bit more for this product, and they probably will, let's imagine they now charge P-Star, and now it costs the NHS £40,000 per patient. Still the same technology, we still expect to gain two qualities, but that £40,000 is also going to displace two qualities. So we gain two, we lose two, we're right on the cusp of saying yes or no. In other words, P-Star is the maximum the, the NHS <clears throat> can afford to pay for this new health technology. What if the manufacturer charges a little bit more, more than P-Star? Now costs the NHS £60,000. It's £30,000 per quality for this new technology. Uh, we can only afford 20. What does it mean? Well, if we do approve, uh, 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 then what do we expect? Well, we gain two, so it's an effective treatment. But you know what, those costs are just going to displace more health elsewhere in our healthcare system. We're going to displace three qualities for every patient treated. If we approve at that price, we're going to reduce health outcomes overall. So that's why John Harris is wrong. <clears throat> that's why you can't make ethical and coherent social choices without accounting for resources. Because you know what, in healthcare, healthcare system resources are somebody else's health. The idea that economists know the price of everything and the value of nothing couldn't be further from the truth. When anybody says that, they're actually talking about accountants, okay? Accountants know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. The job of economists is to understand value. Now, to make this real, we need to be able to estimate what's on the x-axis and the y-axis. And NICE has done a pretty grand job at doing that, uh, using... Uh, uh, actually having decision science at the heart of its methodological reference case. To make these decisions, what does NICE need to know? Well, we need to understand costs and benefits over an appropriate time horizon, when they're gonna differ between the alternatives. For anything with a mortality effect, that time horizon is the patient's lifetime. If we've got a dynamic disease process, it goes way beyond an individual's lifetime. And if we've got long lived investments, it might be over many, many decades that we need to be thinking about this time horizon, way beyond the licensing trials where we have randomized controlled trial evidence. We need to make sure that we're estimating things relevant to our particular target population in the UK and the UK context. We're gonna to have to translate or think about how evidence translates between different contexts we need to compare all relevant alternatives, not just those that have been included in the regulatory trials. We need to use all available evidence, uh, not just the particular licensing trials, but how those effects might be modified, what the baseline risks are, for example, relevant to our population. And we also need to characterise decision uncertainty as well. So on the right is just a little picture of the kind of decision analytic models that are built to support this process within NICE. So decision analytic modeling, we assign distributions to the parameters, we randomly sample in Monte Carlo simulation and estimate costs and effects of the alternatives we're concerned about. And we use that framework to try and extrapolate in a sensible and plausible way beyond 
what we've currently observed and offer decision makers a range of scenarios and let them judge the reasonable plausibility uh, of those alternative scenarios in coming to their in coming to their decision. So that's kind of really brief about a whole edifice of development of methods uh, 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 to do this in health, including the very rapid development over the last two decades of uh, 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 Bayesian network uh, meta-analysis, multiple parameter evidence synthesis, a whole range of things that have been done. And in many ways, it's been the engagement of policymakers that have pushed the methods forward in the field in which I work. But of course, doing all this is not enough, as we saw on that earlier slide. Sure, there's a big task to estimate what the additional health benefits and additional costs of a proposed investment in health might be, but that's not enough. We need to understand what are the health effects of the other things we could do or others could do if we made those additional resources required uh, available to the healthcare system. Or alternatively, if we're not expanding expenditure in healthcare, but we're going to have to find the additional resources from existing commitments, we need to understand the health effects of those things that either we would give up or other people in the healthcare system will give up. And that's been what I've, I've been working on for a good few years now, estimating those health opportunity costs for the UK to inform these kinds of decisions, and importantly, pricing decisions for pharmaceuticals. This is kind of a summary of where we are with that uh, in terms of the published evidence. So this is uh, estimates of the health effects of changes in healthcare expenditure expressed in terms of the cost per quality. How much does the NHS spend at the margin to generate one quality over these 10 waves of expenditure data? Uh, we've got two series here. The, the blue dots represent our original work. The red is uh, relatively new work with a different approach to identification. Effectively here, I won't go into the details, there's a lot to say about it. Um, effectively, we're using cross-sectional variation with instrumental variables, two stage least squared to get these estimates. A couple of other things to notice about this figure is the NICE, the thresholds that NICE uses to make these decisions stated threshold is 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality. What you can see is that all the evidence that we now have is that it's much lower than that, that the NHS is really efficient at generating health at the margin. We get an awful lot of health for relatively modest amounts of money in the NHS. The dotted red line represents the Department of Health's assessment based on this initial work, the original work, of how it assesses health opportunity costs in its impact assessments. And our job in the next two months is to write a report for them to update that. And um, I think you can see that that report is going to be saying actually £10,000 per quality is going to be closer to the mark. What does this tell us about policy? Well, first of all, Although I was a, a founding member of the appraisal committee and devoted much of my life in an unpaid fashion to supporting NICE, I declared war on NICE in 2015, precisely because they were making decisions using thresholds that didn't match up with what we know about what we give up. So is NICE in making decisions about healthcare doing more harm than good? Well, unfortunately it is. So the NICE thresholds, 20 to 30, actually NICE never says no below £30,000 per quality. It goes up to 50 in some circumstances. So for every £10 million of additional resource that NICE decisions commit, and they are mandatory for the NHS, if it approves a technology at £40,000 per quality, £10 million we expect to gain 250 qualities. What do we expect to lose? Well, based on our original works, uh, just over 770 qualities elsewhere. In other words, the ratio uh, of harm to benefit is about three to one. What else can we say? Well, we can start to use this to examine some other policy decisions. If you remember this, it seems a long time ago, 2010, but this was one of the placards billboards used in that election campaign, a commitment to fund all new cancer drugs. That's a very big promise and it's going to require a very big checkbook to fulfil it. Uh, and uh, uh, civil servants and others told ministers at the time, you don't have a 
checkbook big enough to keep that promise. Um, what they did was to create the Cancer Drugs Fund, uh, which was supposed to be a temporary stopgap measure until proper price negotiation mechanisms were in place. The price negotiation mechanisms never happened. But what we are left with is a Cancer Drugs Fund. Uh, and these are the numbers in terms of spend budget, not spend budget of the Cancer Drugs Fund 13 to 2016. In every single one of these years, that Cancer Drugs Fund overspent by more than 100 million pounds. This was money taken from the NHS to devote to new cancer drugs. We have very little evidence of what the benefits were of the drugs that were included. Very few of them had evidence of overall survival benefit. If we take a very optimistic view of what the benefits were, that's what you see in the, uh, in the, uh, in the third column of this table. So in uh, 2015, we spent, or the budget was 340 million. At best, we got 5,000 quality adjusted life years. What did we lose elsewhere? Well, over 26,000 quality adjusted life years in the NHS. So this table and this analysis was used by the Office of National Statistics in their very, uh, not the Office of National Statistics, sorry, the National Audit Office in their very critical report, the Cancer Drugs Fund, which led to its uh, reform. Uh, those reforms happened. Those reforms meant that it could no longer bust its budget, but the Cancer Drugs Fund is still taking 40 million pounds out of the NHS um, every year. Okay, what do we know about this from other countries? Well, I won't go through this, but this idea of the centrality of opportunity cost in these kind of choices has been taken up around the world. Since our original work in 2015, we've got estimates from Australia, Spain, the Netherlands, Sweden. Very recent work published in the United States looking at private healthcare systems <clears throat> and the impact on health of additional healthcare costs, crowding people out of health insurance. We've got Indonesia, South Africa, and very recent work just completed for the Chinese provinces as well. Um, this is all using very similar approach to estimation than our own, which is quite data intensive. What about other healthcare systems where we just don't have that kind of data? Well, we can try and get estimates using country level data. And, and this is what it looks like for low and middle income countries expressed in terms of cost per dally. Uh, on the x-axis, we've got under five mortality rates. And as you can see, it kind of looks how you'd expect that where we've got very high under five mortality rates, very, very small amounts of money can have a huge impact on, on, on health, this time measured in terms of what's called disability adjusted life years averted, a measure of disease burden. Now, until very relatively recently, the World Health Organization, like NICE, had kind of threshold rules to decide whether to recommend things. And their rules were one to three times GDP per capita per disability adjusted life year averted. How does this evidence stack up against those kind of uh, thresholds? Well, these are the low income countries. The dotted rising diagonal is what it would look like if it was one times GDP per capita. In other words, it's way lower than that. Way lower than that. In other words, very, very, very small amounts of additional resource can have a big health impact in these low income countries. And this is what it looks like for middle income countries. What you can see is that one time, even one times GDP per capita is probably significantly too high for many middle income countries. How can we use this usefully? Well, in lots of different ways, but I'm just going to illustrate one way, um, which is we're now in a position to actually express the value either in terms of net health effects or in terms of dollars, equivalent dollars of a range of different interventions and figure out who should can afford to pay for them. And if we want everybody to have them, then the kind of subsidy or the kind of price uh, negotiation, tiered pricing mechanisms we're gonna need to make that available. So we're in a position to have a global demand curve for technologies and interventions across the world. So this is for the HPV vaccination um, across Gavi eligible countries. The dotted line represents the market price of HPV vaccination that's available 
at that time, $25. And what you can see is that for at this time, the World Health Organization made a blanket recommendation. But what you can see is that for many countries, that's just not affordable at that price. And implementing that recommendation would do considerable harm. And by doing this, you can start to inform those questions about when should you make a blanket recommendation? If you're going to make a blanket recommendation, what kind of subsidy or price rebates are you going to have to have to make that work? And it also starts to indicate the kind of tiered pricing system we would need to have to make these kind of technologies widely available across low and middle income countries. The other thing it also tells us, and I haven't got slides about this, but it's work we've been doing with the Gates Foundation, we can use the same principles to start to look at technologies in development. And that's how the Gates Foundation uses this work in assessing their portfolio of R&D, thinking about what is the value and what is the value across low and middle income countries to start to prioritise the foundation's uh, efforts. But so that's kind of the first part. Um, but what about uncertainty? Uh, NICE requires a full characterization of uncertainty through probabilistic analysis of the decision analytic models. Why? Why do we really care about the uncertainty? Why should we care about it? Well, we should care about it, even if the only thing we want are the expected values, even if we just want expectations of health effects and costs. Most of our models, almost all of them, are nonlinear. We've got a nonlinear relationship between par parameter values and net health benefit. And therefore, unless we fully try to fully express the uncertainty, we get the wrong answer in terms of expectation. But there's another reason why we should care about the uncertainty, and that is uh, considering whether we have sufficient evidence and what the benefits of additional evidence are going to be. And I think a clear separation between what do you want to do now, given existing evidence, from that question about do we need more evidence? And in a sense, the traditional rules of inference, hypothesis testing, or even Bayesian benchmark error probabilities, basically confuse these two conceptually separate questions, and as a consequence, don't get a sensible answer to either of them. So we need to use our understanding of uncertainty to start to get to grips with, do we need more evidence to inform this choice in the future? If so, well, what type of evidence do we need and how much of it do we need? We then need to answer the question, well, if we do need more evidence and we know the type of evidence we need, should we wait to approve a new intervention until we get it? And that's going to depend on, do we think we can do the research and get the evidence if we approve? In medicine, that's very unlikely. If you approve a new drug, you're not going to be able to do any randomized, more randomized controlled trials, and there's no incentive for manufacturers to do it. So that's pretty much ruled out in medicine. Even if you could do it, it might be costly to change your mind once you've approved a new intervention. It might not be possible to change your mind at all, or it might be possible, but it's going to be really costly in both time and resource. And finally, if we approve, we might be committing costs or opportunity costs that are going to be irrecoverable. We're never going to be, if we change our mind because the evidence shows that it wasn't a great idea, we're never going to get those costs back. And for all these reasons, our understanding of the need for evidence starts to influence whether we are going to withhold approval until we acquire that evidence. I'm going to try and illustrate the principles. I think you might have had webinars on this as well, but I'll just kind of do my version of it. So when we ask the question, if you remember what I said, I said, let's start with a principle that the thing we care about is health. When we ask the question, is the evidence sufficient? We're not asking the question, can we reject the null hypothesis? We're asking the question, would more evidence improve health? That's, that's the question we're asking. And from the kind of decision analytic models that express uncertainty, we can start to answer that question. Imagine this table represents the output from some decision analytic model, and we've got five uh, iterations from uh, uh, from that simulation process. 
let's imagine there's just five and let's imagine these numbers represent net health benefit in terms of qualities for alternative A and alternative B. Let's imagine alternative A is current clinical practice and B is the new technology. Now, when we do our simulation, what do the results tell us? Well, the results tell us that on average, on expectation, we get more net health benefit with the new technology B than we do with the existing current practice A. So what's the best that we can do now, given what we know? Well, the best that we can do now is to choose B. We approve B, we expect on average to get 12 qualities per patient treated, and that's a gain of one quality. Are we uncertain? Yeah, sure we're uncertain. And in fact, in this case, we're gonna be wrong two out of five times. The error probability is 0.4. Now, most people regard an error probability of 0.4 as being really high, but does that mean you wanna choose A? I don't think so. I mean, choosing A, you're choosing the alternative, which on the basis of expectation, you would expect to be the worst and would have an even higher error probability. So why, why are we bothering with this uncertainty? We, the only reason why we're bothering to look at the uncertainty is because we're trying to ask the question, could we do better? Could we do better? Well, we could do better if only we knew how that uncertainty was going to resolve. If only we knew how the uncertainty was going to resolve, we could make the best choice for every, if you like, realisation of that uncertainty. So for iteration theta 2, we wouldn't choose B, we'd choose A and we'd get 16 rather than 8 qualities. For iteration uh, 4, theta 4, we wouldn't choose B, we'd choose A and we'd get 12 rather than 10 qualities. The problem is right now, we don't know which of those realisations which, which of those possibilities is actually going to be realized. So the value of resolving the uncertainty is the expectation over those possibilities. In other words, the expectation over those maximum values, which is 14 qualities. In other words, we could do better if we resolved the uncertainty. We'd expect to get 14 qualities compared to the 12 with current information. So information's worth two qualities per patient treated, twice as much as the value of providing access to the technology. And so we can do this formally. Here you go, this is EVPI. It's the difference between the expectation of the maximum net benefit and the maximum expected net benefit. Now, of course, we're never gonna fully resolve this uncertainty. So this is giving us an upper bound on the potential value of acquiring more evidence, it provides us with a sufficient condition of deciding to require more evidence to be, uh, to be collected. Just another way of saying the same thing, but it's a kind of slightly different graphic. This is from a, a recent paper, which is uh, uh, doing value of information for an HIV self-testing program in Malawi. It's, uh, the same idea but just a different way of looking at it is that uh, on the uh, on the left top panel we've got the relationship between a parameter value and net health benefit uh, at the uh, at the uh, at the uh, red star you can see the point at which our net benefits become positive if you like that's our trigger point uh, and below we've got the distribution that we believe our parameter is going to take now on the left uh, we would expect with current information that actually this intervention is going to be cost effective and worthwhile. We've got positive net health benefit, but actually there's a chance we're wrong. And that's given by the tail area, the red tail area at the bottom. And in the top panel, it shows us the consequences in terms of loss of net health benefit uh, as a consequence of that uncertainty. On the right, it's pretty much the same thing, except this is the case where we Given parameter values, this technology does not look worthwhile. So based on current information, we would say no and get zero, uh, but there's a chance that we might be wrong and it might be worthwhile given by the tail area uh, on the right and the potential to gain net health benefit uh, if we could only know uh, uh, that, that that was the case. So we can also use this to 
start to think about that question about, well, when have we got enough evidence? And what's the value of making sure we implement what current research findings tell us is the best thing to do versus continuing to do research to try and figure out what the best thing to do is. And, and this is a relatively, it's not actually recent anymore, um, but this was a paper uh, based on work we did for PCORI in the United States, which allocates uh, the 5 billion of uh, comparative effectiveness research allocated in the uh, Obamacare uh, Affordability Care Act. And this is just taking a very classic meta-analysis, a real classic meta-analysis of the trials, looking at thrombolysis uh, following MI and looking at the effect of streptokinase. So this is very historic. It was one of the first cumulative meta-analysis ever conducted. And what you can see is these, these clinical trials have been lined up in time order. And, the, and then we've got the cumulative meta-analysis on the right-hand side. Um, what you can see is that the red arrow points to European 3 in 1979. That was the first time that we had a clinical trial showing a statistically significant effect of streptokinase on mortality and the cumulative meta-analysis also showed a statistically significant result. The question is, was it sensible to wait until then, before we made sure that everybody gets strep kinase. Well, we can do that by looking at the value of information on this clinical endpoint of mortality. And this is kind of what it looks like. European one, which was really early in the sequence, I mean, pretty much throughout, the cumulative meta-analysis shows that streptokinase is a really good idea and the value of implementation per year is saving something between six and 7,000 lives per year, possibly more. At European One though, we're very uncertain. So the value of resolving that uncertainty and continuing to do trials was also very large indeed. Now, the question I guess is posed, if, you were, if we're at the position of European One, the question is, okay, we could implement now, but we won't be able to resolve the uncertainty and to gain that value of information which could actually avert more than 6,000 deaths in the future. How long is the research gonna take? Well, if it's only gonna take a year, so we only need to delay implementation for a year, we're gonna get information that's gonna be valuable in perpetuity for every patient with MI who might need thrombolysis. So at that point, absolutely, it makes sense to continue to do research. But once we get to European 3, the value of implementing our research findings at that point are over 7,000 deaths averted. The only thing we gain by, con by delaying implementation and continuing research is 27 deaths. It's never going to be worthwhile. So you can use kind of value of information and looking at these two alternatives to figure out when is it right to call this um, and say, you know what, we've got enough. Now's the time to say implement. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to labour too much these next few points, but just to point out that everything I've said so far uh, is looking at mutually, mutually exclusive choices between a range of alternatives for a specific patient group with a particular indication. But we can also apply the same principles at a system level. Uh, and this is just a clip from a very recent paper which looked at... Um, the HIV program in Zambia across nine regions. So that HIV program, there's lots of a range of interventions, uh, mutually exclusive, non-mutually exclusive. So the question is, what, um, what package, what collection of interventions do you want to put in your HIV program, given the resource constraints, or for a range of resource constraints, and given the uncertainty, and how much better would that be if only we could resolve some of the key uncertainties surrounding the performance of the elements of this package? And kind of that's what you're looking at here. The, the green line represents the best that can be done for a range of uh, expenditures on HIV in per capita terms uh, uh, across nationally across those nine regions. The red dotted line represents how that would perform if only we could resolve the uncertainty. 
So you can see at, at point A, we could get the same health effects uh, as we get at point A by resolving the uncertainty, but spending $3 less per capita, so point E. In other words, that's one way to look at it. That's transforming the health benefits of information into their equivalent dollar value in terms of this budget, the HIV budget. And that's what you're looking on the on the bottom panel, looking at the, the value of information for the HIV program in dollar terms. It's kind of telling you how much of your HIV expenditure might you wish to devote to resolving some of the key uncertainties in order to maximize impact on health. A bit difficult to summarize a big piece of work in a few seconds, but there you go. It's just a theatrical prop. We can do it at a system level um, as well. Just briefly, uh, I, I don't wanna labor this. I'm just gonna click through these slides. We can use the same framework to identify what type of evidence it is that we need, what's the value of theta one compared to theta two. We can use that same framework to start to examine sequences of research. Do we wanna do research at all? Do we wanna do research on theta one or theta two or both, but also the sequence? Do we wanna do theta one research before we do theta two? or theta two research before we did want to do theta one. And we can do that, we can do that. And, and that can be quite important in the sense that a very small, very quick, very cheap piece of research might provide results, which means we don't have to do the really big expensive piece of research that's gonna take years, for example. And that sequence might be much better than uh, doing them simultaneously. But of course, everything I talked about so far is this kind of necessary condition up a bound on the value of evidence. What we really want to understand is what is the value of actual sample information for a particular research proposal? And, and we can use exactly the same principles. The value of sample information is just the difference between the expected value of decisions based on the predicted posteriors from the possible sample results, given our priors, and a decision based on current evidence. And the difference between that measure of benefit and the cost of sampling, which includes resources, but also time and opportunity costs, gives us, if you like, the net benefit of sampling or the payoff, the societal payoff from conducting actual research. And with that metric, we can start to answer a number of quite interesting questions. We now have a sufficient condition. We do wanna do research if these net benefits are positive. We can solve for the optimal sample size. It's the one that maximizes these, uh, these net benefits. How do we allocate between arms of a trial, for example? Which endpoints? What length of follow-up? What comparators to include? What combination of studies? Well, we evaluate all those possibilities and pick the one with the highest expected net benefit. Um, there you go. Don't have time to talk about it much, but that's... Uh, that's a particular example in uh, influenza. Three studies we could do, a clinical trial, top right, survey to understand quality of life, or an epidemiological study to understand incidence better. And we can identify the value of those things and also their optimal sample size as well. I just wanna finish up on this. I hope it works, it may or may not. But of course, there is a link between uncertainty, the need for evidence and the price we should be willing to pay for a new technology. On the x-axis is price, on the y-axis is net health benefit. And um, as pricing, if we reject, we just get zero, right? We get zero net health benefit. As pricing, when price is very low, we get some net benefit from this technology. As price increases, that declines and ultimately becomes negative uh, at that point marked A stroke R that approval, reject kind of boundary. How do we add uncertainty? Well, this blue line represents what we could have had if we could only immediately resolve all these uncertainties. So that blue line represents the expected value with perfect information. If you imagine that we could costlessly and instantaneously resolve all uncertainties. But of course we can never be on that blue line ever. 
Research takes resources, it takes time. And there's only two ways to get research. You can do the research whilst you approve, that's AWR, approval with research, or you can do the research whilst you withhold approval. In other words, only allow, only approve the use within a research design. Now, I fear I might have run out of time and misjudged it, but what I'm going to say, I'm going to get to the end quickly to preserve time for discussion. So with these two ways of being able to generate research, what does it tell us about the relationship between price and this approve, delay, require research decision? Well, we want to be on the outer envelope of these four possible uh, 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 payoff functions. In other words, when price is very high, we're uncertain, but we're just going to reject and we don't need evidence because the price is so high, the uncertainty is never going to get us to change our mind. It's just not unaffordable. Uh, a slightly lower price, actually, we still would reject based on current evidence, but it's possible that research might get us to change our mind. So that's an only in research recommendation. So restricted, uh, 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 restricted access uh, 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 to uh, to the technology. Below that red line, that's where we think on the balance of evidence this is worthwhile. But if we're only just convinced, then sure we're going to give unrestricted access, but it's going to be conditional and conditional on doing additional research. And if you cut the price low enough, then we're simply going to approve and remove the need for you to conduct uh, more research. So in a sense, there's a, there's a menu of options ranging from the far left, unrestricted and unconditional access to the far right, which is totally restricted access and a straight reject. And if the list price is given by that blue arrow, then you can start to see the scale of discounts we're going to require from manufacturers to get her into, into these different categories of uh, conditional and restricted guidance. Just going to show you one more thing. In many circumstances, if we approve, we can no longer do the research. It's certainly true in medicine. We're not going to be able to do randomized trials. We need to remove that, that AWR line. What happens when we do that? What happens when we do that is it means that actually we're going to have to have an even bigger price discount before we approve you for use. Because by approving you for use, we are giving up the benefits of acquiring more information about your product. So I'll just finish on the final slide. Implications and prospects. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we've had we do have we have had an impact on on, on UK policy in terms of health. Um, and I think also to some extent in other high income countries and in some low income countries as well. I think also at global bodies, the Gates Foundation in particular. But also WHO, WHO removed their one to three times GDP per capita. There's current discussions around tiered pricings going on. I think the value of information stuff has had less impact than the kind of cost effectiveness and we need to understand health opportunity costs so far. I think for me, at least, what motivates me is not the geekiness, although I do like geekiness. What motivates me is it's about accountability. And I think Decision science, when applied to social choice, can add to the accountability of current social arrangements. So at an international level, exposing global inequalities. At a national level, exposing the fact that our NHS generates health for very small amounts of money. And at a local level in terms of uh, choices that have been made on our behalf. So I'll leave it there and apologise for going over what I, how much time I plan to use on this. Um. Good, very, thanks very much, Carl. That was uh, very informative. Um, we um, have a few uh, questions already coming up in the chat, and I mean, certainly um, some of them relate to, um, you know, my observation is that these kind of methods have hardly um, been begun to be used in environmental research and monitoring in terms of prioritizing uh, research and investments. Um, so one might ask the question why? I mean, um, they've been widely used in health, although I, I, I think you've had some struggles to get them adopted at some stages as well. Uh, but we're a long way from, from getting that in, in, in terms of um, environmental 
uh, uh, topics. Um, I think I think I think it's fair to say that certainly struggled and continued to struggle to really get concepts of value of information embedded uh, in decision making. That 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 is still a struggle. Um, the earlier yeah, so, I think we've had a lot of success, but the value of information remains a struggle. I mean, Steve sort of asked the related question: Is you know how might these approaches be employed to explore environmental gain? And the cost of schemes to improve environmental status uh, is giving an example of the new post-Brexit agriculture environment uh, will introduce concepts of public good from public money. You know, what are the learning points that we can carry carry over um, into the environmental sector? Um, uh, 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 for me, like, like I tried to express at the start, you know, I'm fundamentally an economist and kind of fell into health almost by accident very early in my career and it became the best place to have opportunities to pursue kind of accountable quantitative work with a policy audience for me it just trans it all translates it's just decision science right so it does yeah. translate um you're not going to be using qualities but that's fine i mean you do this in a kind of cost benefit framework as well um i suppose the things that I would, I'll just express my mistakes. Uh, I, I, I think I made a mistake early in my career, um, which was that I tried to uh, sell a method because it was really neat, rather than understand that before people buy anything, they need a problem. You need to be the solution to a problem. And I didn't spend enough time on making sure people understood they had a problem. Uh, for me to be able to sell a solution to them and I think the other thing I did was people in, often said well you know Carl yeah but what about this and you missed a bit and you missed a bit and you missed a bit and I devoted an awful lot of my career early on to making the methods more sophisticated and trying to capture all the things that people said were missing uh, and I kind of missed the point that the reason why they didn't want to use these methods wasn't because I'd missed a bit it's because they didn't want to be held accountable and and I diverted too much of my energy into imagining that I could make this so swanky that I'd have captured everything. And of course, you can't capture everything ever. Mm. So I guess that, you know, if I had my time over again, that's the lesson I would learn. Make sure people know they've got a problem before you try and sell them something. And secondly, when people say you missed a bit, well, is that why they don't like it? Mm, not so sure. Yeah, I mean, um, one, um, Ron, Ron Costanja uh, raises one issue, which is, I think, makes it more complex for us in the environmental sector, because you, know, you, use, you use quality adjusted life years in most of your analysis, sort of, which is one dimension, and we're sort of dealing with, um, you know, land, sea, air, uh, environmental health, and there isn't sort of one... Um, you know, one metric we can use for just health. One of the biggest arguments we get into is actually how to measure health. I mean, even in soil science, which is the, 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 the realm of the several of us here, you know, we get to, to endless arguments and debates about how do you define measure soil health? Just That's just one tiny component of the environment. Um, so we're, we're all faced with that kind of level of complexity. So have you got any advice on, on, that, on that way, on that area? Absolutely. I think I think that's I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think even in health, people are still arguing about how to measure health. You know that 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 kind of never ends, and people argue it from principal positions. But what we find is, you know, manufacturers and their supporters constantly arguing about, you know, you can't use qualities. You know, qualities are this, qualities are that. Um, so, so I, I don't think that ever ends, even if you just take that narrow dimension of health. I guess what I would say is that um, the, the real difficulty, I think, is, okay, spit it out, Carl. Mainstream economics has got a particular view of how to characterise social welfare based on markets and their surrogates. And that's what lies at the heart of cost benefit analysis. That is not a social 
a definition of social welfare that I recognise or I think is widely recognised. And these ideas of social welfare are quite rightly profoundly disputed. And that kind of leaves you in a bit of a difficult place when you've got multiple effects that need to be brought together. Certainly what we've tried to do for decision making, when we have done projects that go way beyond health, health is one component of the benefit, is to try and set out the analysis saying, look, if you, this is, this is, this is the implication given these sets of trades between these different attributes. And this is the evidence about how people have thought about the trades between these attributes. But it's not up to us as analysts to tell you what those trades ought to be or to impose a social welfare function. But if you choose alternative A versus B, it implies that you believe this attribute is 10 times more valuable than this attribute. Do you really want to go on record saying that, Minister? Mm -hmm. Um, Steve raised a point that was similar to something I was going to raise as well, and that's at you know what at what scale do you do you sort of make these trade-off decisions? I mean, you could look at you know your research budget within a department and say, well, how is the money best spent in terms of the you know expected benefits? Um, or you could that that could be done at national level. You could even do it at global level and say, well, you know. Um, you know, a lot of the funding should go into developing countries because you're getting so much greater benefit for the amount spent. Um, I guess it comes down to you know, who's who owns the money at the, the end of the uh, the end of the day. But uh, I wondered if you got into those kind of issues in terms of the scale at which you make these trade-offs. Absolutely. So um, I guess the way I would characterise it is unlike some economists, mainstream economists, we don't believe our job is there to impose a view of social welfare on the rest of the world and imagine that everybody's done what we think ought to be regarded as efficient. Rather, our job is to say, look, for example, let's take the NHS. Given the amount that you've devoted to the NHS, this is what you're getting at the margin. It's about £10,000 per quality. Are you happy with that? Uh, I hope I'm making sense here. It, so we've done work that's broken down um, health expenditure in the UK. So we've estimated this for public health expenditure at local authority level. That's £3,000 per quality. We've done it for social care. So, it's a, so we regard our job as setting that out, saying, look, you know, this is, this is what's happening at the margin. Are you happy with that? Do you think this is reasonable that you cut public health expenditure but protected the NHS? Given that it's only £10,000 per quality for the NHS, how does that play out when you do your uh, public expenditure review? Uh, I hope I've, uh, I'm not sure I've really hit you. I think, I think what I would argue is that our job certainly the way I see, I see our job is to express the value of the constraints as they currently are, communicate that effectively to those in positions to change those constraints by raising more taxes, reallocating public expenditure or doing other things to release other constraints, but by exposing the real value of those constraints and their relative value at least we make them accountable for their action or inaction. I guess that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I don't regard us and, and, and my research teams as in the position of telling society how they should reorganise things, but exposing this is the way it is right now. Are you happy with that? Yeah, um, perhaps a, a final one, um, Councillor Alex uh, Bush. Uh, I've seen a lot of interest in the health benefits of a more healthy environment. Um, and in fact, there was something on the news yesterday about the health of the oceans benefiting human health. Um, in an argument that public health investment in our environment would indirectly save money on public health expenses, uh, given how much we struggle to characterize environmental health uh, and the points about or to adopted life, life years, where, where would a value, in a, a value of information begin to address this? 
um, I guess in terms of trying to prioritize you know, what the, the, the gains from research which will include public health benefits, uh, but I'll, I'll let you handle that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bit like early stage modeling in a way it's some stuff that we do which is everything i've said so far is about evaluative research in other words what is what do we believe the value is of acquiring more information about interventions which are kind of already out there the other question is i hope this is addressing your question the other question is what is the value of developing new stuff and uh the value of developing new stuff requires us to think carefully about what we think that might look like and how uncertain we might be. And okay, apologies, I've drunk too much coffee today. I'll try and say it more clearly. There's a kind of real options thing going on here that when you're at an early stage of developing an intervention and you don't know whether it's going to work and you're going to have to put money into that R&D program, it's wrong to just look at your expectation of the net present value of that effort because actually by putting the effort into developing that you actually resolve some of the uncertainties as well in other words the value of that effort is both the net present value plus the value of the information you get through that effort mm. once you've developed that and then the question becomes, OK, should we implement it? And by implementing it, you shut down the possibility of acquiring more information about it. Then actually, it's kind of the opposite. Then uncertainty makes that purchase less valuable because you're giving up the future evidence. So um, I kind of think that's part of it, that um, if what you're talking about is developing new strategies that you don't know how they're going to perform and that requires some upfront investment it like R&D to figure out what this strategy is going to look like and how it's going to perform, then actually the value of information makes those efforts more valuable because you're investing a real, you're getting real option value here. Mm. I'm not sure if that worked. Yeah, no, I, I, I never thought about that. So double benefit for. Um, I think we better wrap it up here. But I mean, uh, it'd be, be really, uh, I'd really like to see some of these applications being taken over into environmental um, prioritization, um, even in, in prioritizing environmental monitoring, uh, but also intervention strategies. So uh, really hope we can see some of this work coming across uh, and being applied. Uh, with that, we thank you very much indeed, uh, Carl, for, for giving this talk and giving us these insights. Uh, it's been quite fascinating to learn uh, from the health sector. And um, we'll put up the webinar on the site for people to download and uh, see at their leisure. And um, thank you once again uh, for taking the time to, to, to deliver this. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, thank you, Carl. That was great. Thanks, guys. Thanks to Charlotte yeah. and Nurk for uh, hosting, uh, hosting this webinar. Yeah. Thanks very much.